This is why the moon hoax uh, would have been impossible. Take one. Did people go to the moon in 1969? I'm not totally sure. I wasn't on the moon then. Did they fake going to the moon? No, I'm pretty sure they didn't because they couldn't. Some people say that in 1969 people were incapable of sending a man to the moon, but that they were capable of staging the whole thing in a TV studio. In fact, the opposite is true. By the late 1960s, they did have the technical ability, not to mention the requisite madness, to send three guys to the moon and back. They did not have the technology to fake it on video. Now, please understand, I'm not saying this to defend the honor of the United States. The U.S. government lies all the time about all kinds of things, and if they haven't lied to you today, maybe they haven't had coffee yet. So, it's easy to believe the Apollo program was a lie, too, especially if you weren't alive then, and uh, if you don't know much about the technology profiles of the day. You see, the later you were born, the more all-powerful movie magic seems. Uh, nowadays, it would be very easy to fake a moon landing, and we seem to have forgotten how to do it for real. Uh, back then, it was the other way around, really. Ever since the 1920s, engineers were trying to improve liquid-fueled rockets and their guidance systems. They wanted to go to outer space. The people who were paying for it wanted better bombs. By 1943, Werner von Braun's people already had a fully functional suborbital rocket called the Aggregate Fear, later known as the V-2. After the war, the German rocket scientists went to work for two rival superpowers who then went to insane lengths to outdo each other on the world stage. It was a global dick-wagging contest on a scale never before seen in human history. It's fair to say that technology growth in the Cold War was mostly a competition in aerospace, rocketry, and weapon science. That was the kind of engineering people strove to excel in. And by the mid-60s, limited space travel was a possibility, I think. Meanwhile, film technology had gotten wider and television was still busy trying to be in color. Now, here's where the stories diverge. Um, in one version, the Americans waste 20 billion dollars to send three guys to the moon, uh, plant the plaque that says we came in peace for all mankind, and then go home to bomb Cambodia. Uh, in the more tantalizing version, NASA at some point realizes they just can't. So to avoid humiliation, they hire Stanley Kubrick to produce and direct the moon landing telecasts. You know, he did such a great job with 2001. Years later, once the Apollo astronauts are starting to collect Medicare, some people get a lot of attention by pointing out flaws in the photographic evidence from Apollo. When you listen to them, they seem not to know very much about photography or video or lighting or even perspective, and I think they're hoping you don't either. So we should have seen stars in the sky? No, we shouldn't. The camera was set to expose for broad daylight. If they were exposing for stars, then this picture would have looked more like this. Hmm. Flags waving in the breeze? No, it isn't. It's wiggling in the vacuum after they let it go. And uh, the shadows diverge unrealistically across the landscape? No, they don't. Go outside sometime and see how shadows work. They obviously used multiple light sources in this picture, right? No, they obviously didn't. Uh, I've been shooting in the studio for about 30 years now. I know what to look for. When you shine two lights at something, you get two shadows. So this would have looked more like this. But it doesn't, because this stuff was shot with a single light source. And if that light was anywhere near the action, you would have seen a fall off in brightness across the terrain. You don't, because the light source was 150 million kilometers away, too far away for the inverse square law to make a difference. Get it? Etc. Etc. Blah blah blah. The thing is, all these discussions are ignoring one simple point. In 1969, it was not yet possible, technically, to fake what we saw on TV. Why are people missing this? I think maybe they forget how primitive video was in 1969. I mean, it was an amazing achievement in electronics, but there was a lot they couldn't do. Uh, let me try to explain that.
The pivotal claim for the Apollo hoax theory, without which it all falls apart, is that what we saw on TV was slow motion footage of astronauts running around in a film studio. Because if it wasn't slow motion, it couldn't have happened on Earth, right? Let's talk about how slow motion works in film and video. There are two ways to make motion slow. One is you shoot it at normal speed and play it back slow. The other is you shoot it fast and play it back normal. The second way is called overcranking. It looks smoother and more realistic because you're sampling natural motion at a higher frame rate. But that means we would have had to shoot it on film using high-speed film cameras, right? Why? Uh, because in 1969 there were no high-speed video cameras yet. The electronics just weren't there. Some people did have a magnetic disc recorder that could capture normal speed video and play it back slow. They used it for sports replays. It could record up to 30 seconds. Play back at uh, 10 FPS and you've got a whopping 90 seconds of slow-mo. I'm sticking with 10 frames per second because that was the video frame rate for Apollo 11. They had a non-interlaced slow-scan TV camera, especially made for them by Westinghouse. Uh, all the later missions were using regular NTSC cameras running at 2997 FPS. That would be three times harder to fake. I'm trying to make this easy. Keep in mind that when people today watch documentaries about the Apollo missions, they're looking at the highlights. They're looking at, you know, short clips cut together. And short clips are much easier to fake. But in July 1969, 600 million people, including me, were all staring at a continuous lunar telecast that went on for a long time. It's actually pretty boring sometimes. Um, at 16 minutes into the EVA, they turn on the video camera. Four minutes later, you get your one small step thing. Then Aldrin climbs out. And they move the camera onto a tripod and proceed to do all their moon walking, flag planting, photo snapping, and rock picking. Then Armstrong climbs back up into the lander and it's over. Um, by which time the video camera has been running for 143 minutes. So if we're faking this with electronic slow mo at one third speed, we only need to record about 47 minutes of continuous live action video. Well, that's a lot more than that Ampex disc recorder could hold. But NASA is special. Maybe they have a big disc recorder, right, in 1969. Okay, how much bigger? 95 times bigger? I don't know, man. I mean, government agencies are powerful, but they're not God. Then again, they are NASA. Maybe they did have some special way to overcrank video uh, in 1969 for an hour and a half. Maybe they had some top secret high-speed electronics that the rest of the world never knew about. Oh, wait a minute. No, you guys said that uh, their navigation computers were too slow. <clears throat> I guess we can't have it both ways. I mean, it can't be fast and slow at the same time, right? Wouldn't it be easier to shoot this on film? I mean, in 1969, we already knew how to overcrank film. Um, for Apollo 11, we only need to shoot 30 FPS and play it back at 10. Okay, let's try that. I'd recommend you shoot on 35 millimeter to minimize the film grain. That's what Kubrick would have done. Now let's see, normal 35 millimeter runs at 90 feet per minute, but since we're shooting at 30 FPS, that'll be 112 and a half feet per minute. We need uh, 47 minutes of original film, so that's about 5,300 feet. And of course, there's no such thing as a film magazine that big. Volkswagen. But if you shoot thousand foot loads, that's about that big, then you can do it in five mags. Um, oh wait, I can do this. You don't want to see the splice marks where you put the reels together because then everybody would know it was a fake. And remember, we're shooting for TV, so it's 133 aspect ratio and not 185. So that means you have to do A and B rolls. You have to cut the negative into A and B rolls and print them onto a 5300 foot fine grained interpositive then cut an answer print in the film lab. And when you're done make sure everybody that works in the film lab dies mysteriously in a car crash. Now, now you just need to find a custom designed telecine that can transfer your 5300 foot answer print to video at 10 frames per second. Pin registered of course. 
How hard can that be? Of course, you need to be absolutely certain that in all that splicing and printing and transferring, uh, none of the most common film artifacts have gotten onto your giant print. No base scratches, no emulsion flakes, no gate weave, no grain, and not one single fleck of dust. Because any one of those things will instantly betray that this is a hoax. Okay, so you do that, and then you do it again for five more lunar missions. Only those later missions, you have to play back at 30 FPS, meaning you have to shoot at like 60 FPS, twice the torque, twice as many splices to keep clean, uh, twice as much of a chance that the film's going to break in the camera. You think maybe it would be easier to just go to the moon? Hmm, I don't really know if that's possible. Like I said, I wasn't on the moon in 1969, and neither were you. I can tell you that in 1969, it was not possible, technically, to fake what we saw on TV. Sorry, Kubrick or no Kubrick. Um, why does any of this matter? Well, my concern is with the ultimate fate of knowing, of seeing the difference between what you can know and what you wish for. Because that's what puts the sapiens in Homo sapiens. Without that, you're just another homo. The urge to believe drives people to trade in part of their soul in exchange for the comfort of being a rebel. Okay. But that step from knowing that you've been lied to to believing that everything else is a lie is a big step. Once you're forced to hypothesize whole new technologies to keep your uh, conspiracy possible, then you've stepped over into the realm of magic. It demands a deep and abiding faith in things you can never know. It's like you need to cling to your belief system with all your might against the overwhelming evidence of your own rational mind. And some people do. What's dangerous about that is that it blinds you to the real conspiracies that authorities are perpetrating on you right now. As we speak. Things that are a lot more important than whether some guys went to the moon. If I, I'm, I mean, I'm not America, but if I were, I would much rather have you be questioning Apollo 11 and not questioning the Patriot Act, the Iraq War, the financial industry bailouts, and the uh, right to indefinite military detention without charge. Those things are real. Thank you for watching. Excellent. My check came from NASA.